Welcome to today's uh, combustion webinar. Um, today's speaker, it's Asad Masri from the uh, School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Mechatronic Engineering at the University of Sydney. Uh, Professor Assad, uh, his uh, long distinguished career in combustion research, in particular in turbulent combustion uh, experiments and modeling. He served as numerous positions in the uh, Combustion Institute, uh, the latest of which was organizing this year's combustion symposium in Australia under very difficult circumstances and was a real success. So uh, we're great to have him here. And uh, today he's going to tell us about spray flows and uh, their applications in uh, combustion research. So. The floor is yours, Asad. Take it away. Thank you very much, Isaac, for this uh, generous introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending. I know uh, for some of you, it's probably uncivilized times. Uh, so I apologize for that. And I'm grateful for your, uh, for your attendance. I would also like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me this uh, excellent opportunity. Uh, but also, I'd like to congratulate them uh, on uh, this initiative that brings together the uh, combustion community online uh, on a regular basis, well outside the uh, uh, conference uh, times. So that's, uh, uh, we're all grateful uh, for that. Uh, while I'm uh, uh, thanking people, I'd like also to start off by thanking the uh, uh, funding agency, the Australian Research Council, that has been so generous uh, funding my research over the past uh, uh, 30, 35 years or so, and they continue to, uh, to do that, which is great. Uh, I'm grateful to my colleagues and collaborators, uh, local uh, collaborators, uh, uh, Cleary, uh, Dunn, and Kormatsis, and also international collaborators. Uh, 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 there's many of them. I won't mention uh, uh, them all, but I'll mention Barlow and Bob Luck at Purdue, and uh, 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 Bill Roberts at Kaus and his team, uh, so these are the people I've collaborated with on a uh, spray related uh, uh, issue. And of course, my team of postdocs and PhD uh, students uh, who have done all the work that I'm going to be presenting throughout uh, the next uh, a few minutes or so. The talk is going to progress something along these lines. I'll start with a fairly extensive background and, and uh, put everything into context. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll dwell on that for a little bit intentionally. And then I'll, uh, I'll cover three topics, essentially primary atomization, where I'll scan uh, existing knowledge. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about recent work that we have uh, uh, contributed both in uh, 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 Newtonian as well as non-Newtonian viscoelastic fluid. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about computations of atomization with a specific focus on the uh, volume of fluid approach. Um, and then the last section of the talk will be about den uh, turbulent uh, dense uh, spray uh, flames. And I'll show you some of the recent work that we have done and published in this space and where uh, we're, we're moving then and what else needs to be done in this space uh, will form the subject of the uh, uh, conclusion. So um, uh, we are just talking about COVID and COVID vaccines and so on. Uh, now, if there is a positive aspect of COVID, then it's really that it's uh, uh, refocused the interest in, in sprays, albeit uh, the atomization of viscoelastic fluid. Uh, but it has also how highlighted how little we know uh, about uh, uh, sprays. So the rules and regulations that have been uh, imposed with respect to uh, you know, limiting the transmission of the disease and the 1.5 meter rule and so on, that's really originated from research that sort of date back to, uh, uh, to the 60s uh, uh, and, and possibly uh, earlier. Uh, and there's been a lot of recent work that uh, has shed new light uh, on the uh, uh, transmission of uh, uh, disease, uh, uh, transmission of, uh, uh, of this virus uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, particularly the interplay between the small droplets and the large droplets. So the questions uh, that sort of posed themselves were, what are the fragment numbers and the size distribution of fragments with various vocal activities, that is coughing, sneezing, and talking. And the second question, how long do these droplets that are generated, how long uh, do they get suspended in the air? So in, in attempting to answer uh, these questions, there's been various laboratories are doing uh, uh, a lot of recent work on this, and I'm quoting them uh, here at the bottom of the, uh, of the slides, but I'll just reference here the work of uh, Daniel Bonn and co-workers uh, from the Netherlands, who's just published recent work on this. 
and they give, they, they show some interesting results. They, you know, for sneezes and coughs, uh, um, uh, roughly about 10 to the 4 to about 100 droplets are, uh, are, are released with velocities of the order of about 10 meters a second for cough and about 20 meters a second for sneezes. The interesting bit is shown on the right-hand side of this plot where the probability distribution is bimodal, uh, as you see from the, uh, from the blue curves there, where you have droplets that are fragments uh, that are about 500 uh, microns on the mean. Uh, and this is a gamma distribution that is shown there. And uh, on the other extreme at the low end, there is also a distribution of, uh, of droplets that are of the order of about three, uh, three microns. And these droplets tend to be uh, uh, suspended in the air for a longer period of time. And the ones that actually drop within about one, 1 1.5 meters are larger fragments. Now, when people are speaking, as I'm doing now, I'm spewing out about 50 particles per second. And these particles are fairly tiny particles. And that's given by the yellow curve here. So the yellow distribution here is showing that these uh, uh, particles are about three microns on the mean, again, given a gamma distribution. And these particles uh, are the ones that remain suspended in the air for quite a while. Now, how long do they stay suspended in the air? That depends really on how much ventilation there is around and, uh, and, it, and the, the uh, duration of their suspension can vary by about an order of magnitude. So if the place is well ventilated, as is shown by the green uh, uh, curve, by the green plot, uh, their suspension in the air can be about uh, 30 seconds. And, uh, but that can increase by an order of magnitude up to about a minute, up to about, sorry, 300 seconds, five minutes, that is, if the place is not ventilated. And that is, uh, uh, you know, that, that is significant with respect to the uh, associated risk of those particle suspensions. And it's interesting that the World Health Organization has taken a long time to realize that this transmission through suspended particles is a real thing. And, and uh, in, in Australia, we've had incidents of that. We still impose quarantine for people, uh, that is Australian resident to, uh, 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 who, who travel back to their country, they get quarantined for two weeks. And then we've had incidents where there's been a transmission of these of the, of, of the virus uh, through particles suspended in the air that are not captured by the air conditioning, by the filters of the air conditioning system. So these are issues of spray and spray atomization, albeit for a viscoelastic fluid. That's not obviously the only area where spray is relevant. Spray, non-reacting as well as reacting sprays are relevant in many other uh, areas that are, um, that are the subject of this talk. Uh, 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 in drying operations, be it drying of uh, food products, uh, 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 juice powders, milk, uh, or in, in spray painting, that's, a, uh, that's an issue. Uh, in agriculture, that's also particularly with respect to targeted uh, spraying of crops, that's uh, also a, a an important problem, albeit with agriculture, the droplet size distribution is larger. So we're not talking about micron size droplets, we're talking about perhaps larger droplets. And with pharmaceuticals, it's a hot topic these days with the delivery of drugs into the right, um, into the right region within the uh, within the airways and the lungs. So this is, a, uh, this is an area that's receiving a lot of attention, uh, bridging uh, uh, engineering as well as uh, pharmacy. And we are doing a fair bit of work in this uh, space as well. So what about uh, uh, reacting? So what about combustion? Uh, well, with combustion, uh, uh, spray uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is an important topic and it will remain an important topic, particularly uh, in, in gas turbines and in certainly uh, uh, heavy duty uh, engines uh, uh, where the use of spray is going to stay with us for a long uh, time. Uh, but I'm going to spend a, few, a, a little bit of time on the uh, continuing, continued use of space uh, of, uh, of um, uh, sprays in light uh, duty vehicles. And here I'm going to show two or three slides that I've shown earlier in my uh, plenary uh, uh, talk. So the common uh, uh, or the accepted wisdom these days is that battery electric vehicles are going to replace uh, 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 internal combustion engines. 
uh, and they're going to uh, be the norm um, in the uh, in the future. And that may be so, but that's really imposed by uh, by regulations. And I might say he misguided regulations because they claim that the uh, battery electric vehicle has zero emissions. And as uh, Al Kuwaiter uh, said in his invited industry talk at the symposium, uh, he said that car manufacturers are uh, working with their hands tied behind their back because they get these uh, um, uh, uh, carbon uh, 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 quotas uh, imposed on them uh, through regulations that say that uh, battery electric vehicles uh, do not emit any CO2. So if you do life cycle analyses uh, on these vehicles and then you take into account the full life cycle of the vehicle from manufacturing to the operation of the vehicle, you see a different story. And that's what I'm gonna dwell a little bit on uh, with this graph. So here I'm using results of El Gwaini uh, performed using a, uh, a well-known uh, life cycle analysis code uh, that's called GREET at Argonne National Laboratories. Uh, and it stands for Greenhouse Gas Regulated Emissions and Energy Use in Transportation. And what they have surveyed here is a range of vehicles from internal combustion engines being gasoline and diesel to uh, hybrid uh, vehicles, that is the hybrid electric, uh, and then gasoline electric, and also the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and the electric BEV with a range of 210 uh, uh, kilometers. Um, uh, the black bars on the top uh, show the current uh, technology and the current uh, uh, rate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in terms of CO2 per mile. Uh, and the green bars at the bottom of that show future technology uh, given the developments that are likely to take place in the next um, uh, 25 years. And what this graph, uh, uh, this plot shows uh, is two things essentially. One is that battery electric vehicles are not zero emission vehicles and they contribute anywhere between uh, 300 to uh, 350 uh, grams of CO2 per mile now. Uh, and then that drops down to a much lower number later, of course. But the other point to be made with respect to this graph is that the internal combustion engine vehicles in terms of their emission of CO2 uh, per mile uh, are not far uh, from those of BEVs, right? Uh, so so uh, uh, yes, there is a difference, but that difference gets smaller and smaller, particularly when you're looking at gasoline hybrid electric vehicles where the gap between those and the uh, electric uh, BEVs is uh, small. So, so that's a uh, that's a fact, and these are uh, these are numbers that are generated uh, from a, a comprehensive life cycle analysis. In that life cycle analysis, it assumed that the lifetime of the vehicle is 150,000 uh, kilometers. Now we all know from our use of. Uh, 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 laptop batteries and phone batteries and so on, that the current battery technology uh, uh, means that in few years time, uh, after, a, after a certain lifetime, the battery's performance degrades and it needs to be changed within a, a certain period of time. So in the absence of a breakthrough in battery technology, the trend is that those batteries are likely to degrade in performance after a while and they're likely to be changed, uh, maybe within 150,000 kilometers or maybe earlier. So then if one accounts for a battery change or for one change of the battery pack, now the battery pack comes loaded with six tons of CO2. So if you account for uh, one or two changes of battery packs, as is shown by this vertical green arrow that I'm showing uh, here with a slide borrowed from Sean Cook, then what it means then is that the battery electric vehicles become more uh, or will emit more CO2 than the standard diesel engine and certainly more than the standard hybrid electric uh, uh, vehicle. So these are important points that need to be made and one would wish that the regulators would take these into consideration. Another point in favor now of internal combustion engine is the advent of electrofuels. Now, electrofuels are fuels that are, uh, uh, there are different terminologies for these electrofuels, e-fuels, uh, 
uh, synthetic fuels, solar fuels, and so on and so forth. But essentially, they are fuels that are generated from renewable electricity uh, and where the uh, uh, renewable energy uh, source is used to break down the water through electrolysis or other processes to form hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen has one of three possible fates. Uh, it can be uh, used directly in um, in fuel cells or it can be burned uh, or it can be uh, stored uh, in um, liquid organic uh, hydrogen carriers and transported to other uh, locations for use uh, another fate possible fate for the hydrogen is that it's combined with co2 where the co2 is sequestered from industrial processes existing industrial processes or it is uh, uh, obtained from the uh, from the atmosphere, and then it's subjected to a range of processes: methanation, Fischer-Tropsch processes, uh, methanol uh, synthesis, uh, uh, and for, and dehydrogenation to produce fuels like methane, liquid hydrocarbons, methanol, or hexymethylene ethers with various ranges: OME zero to OME five or six, um, uh, which are standard uh, hydrocarbons. And the third path, of course, is that the hydrogen and the nitrogen uh, is, are combined in a Haber-Bosch process or other uh, synthesis of hydrogen and nitrogen to produce ammonia. So the list of fuels the, uh, on the right-hand side here are um, uh, electrofuels if they generate it from uh, renewable sources, but they're identical to the current fuels that we are using uh, now, which are fossil-based. And the uh, 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 idea here is that uh, uh, those uh, electrofuels will gradually come to the market um, uh, uh, and they're initially be blended with fossil fuels, but eventually when the price is right and the technology is right, they will come in as pure, clean fuels with zero carbon emission. Admittedly, the price is not favorable now and their cost, uh, they're expensive, uh, as shown from that plot on the left-hand side, where uh, we're showing by the green bars, the cost of fossil, of electro fuels uh, uh, from different sources of um, renewable. Now, the uh, from Baltic, from the Baltic seas, uh, with wind energy being the source, that's the first bar, from Africa and the Middle East, with solar being the source of energy, that's the middle bar, and from Iceland with hydro and geothermal energy uh, with the uh, third bar uh, there, and they're all uh, higher or more expensive than the fossil gasoline, which is the blue line there. Uh, now, admittedly, uh, 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 the price now is, is, is uh, double uh, to uh, perhaps four times that of gasoline, but if you project to 2050, you see the gap narrowing significantly to uh, a maximum of about uh, twice the price of gasoline or even less. Uh, so the uh, uh, hope is that uh, the uh, future of these electrofuels will come down significantly and with that it will make the use of uh, uh, sprays and fuels in internal combustion engines both in light duty vehicles as well as in uh, heavy duty vehicles uh, uh, favorable as well. So essentially with this long introduction, uh, and I apologize for that, I'm making the point that sprays uh, will remain highly uh, relevant uh, in uh, both non-reacting as well as reacting applications. Now, sprays uh, pose tough problems, despite the fact they've been used for, uh, uh, for decades, uh, uh, but the difficulty remains, particularly uh, with the two issues, particularly with the atomization of sprays uh, and with the uh, combustion and the uh, uh, formation of pollutants. So the questions that are sort of evident uh, are, uh, are listed here. How much control do we have on the atomization processes with respect to size and number densities? Uh, how well do we, con do we, do we control and model uh, the atomization? Uh, uh, what is the effect of the spray structure uh, on the combustion modes and on the emissions? And finally, how well can we compute the entire process from atomization to uh, combustion and the formation of pollutants? So I'll start off with atomization. 
And I'll preamble that by saying that when we're talking about atomization, there's various modes of atomization, as everyone knows. Uh, there's, of course, the uh, uh, pressure atomization, air blast atomization, effervescent atomization, electrosprays, and there's also flow blurring and so on, which is another sort of mini effervescent type of atomization. I won't talk about these. I'll simply say that, you know, we're in the business of uh, 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 even uh, combining different modes of atomization in order to provide a larger degree, con degree of control on the atomization process and on the droplet formation processes. But for the sake of this talk, I will dwell only on primary, uh, on sorry, uh, uh, air blast atomization. Uh, and uh, uh, but but I'll just uh, uh, I want people to um, uh, to note uh, that uh, the um, uh, the other modes are uh, uh, are important uh, as well uh, 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 for this particularly for the sake of using those in conjunction with air blast atomization to provide a finer degree of control. Now. With air blast atomization, there is uh, two, two uh, I guess, main configuration. One is, is an axisymmetric one, where you have the liquid issuing from a central nozzle, be it just a circular uh, nozzle or a slot. Um, and then that is surrounded by a, um, uh, uh, that is surrounded by an air blast stream, and the air blast stream uh, will have sufficiently high momentum in order to initiate instabilities uh, in the uh, early part of the of the jet core, and those instabilities will uh, lead to uh, atomization depending on relevant uh, uh, conditions. That is, uh, and we'll we'll talk about these conditions in a minute as to what are the effective Weber numbers. The other configuration is. Uh, 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 is more relevant in um, in the uh, 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 gas turbine industry with respect to pre-filming, uh, where you uh, form a liquid film uh, on a surface and you air blast it uh, 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 so that as it leaves the um, uh, the uh, uh, hard surface, uh, it is fragmented into uh, uh, forms that are not unlike. Uh, those seen in the uh, standard axisymmetric uh, type configuration, where you see lots of filaments and fragments leading to leading to droplets. Now, this mode is also highly relevant to uh, liquid film cooling, where you have a heated air stream uh, on a, a liquid film, and there is an interaction and atomization between the liquid film and the um, uh, and the heated air stream, and that's also a highly relevant configuration to. Uh, 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 hybrid rockets, uh, where hybrid rocket engines, uh, where a solid fuel is used, uh, the solid fuel is liquefied uh, with a heated air stream, and there is a, a, a an atomization process or fragment exchange between the heated free uh, the heated uh, flow and the um, uh, liquid uh, fill. Now. The air blasting can be done in, in two uh, ways as well, a cross flow uh, at uh, 90 degrees or at different angles uh, 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 with some uh, gas turbine manufacturers they do use, not necessarily for, for uh, 90 degrees, but could be a different, uh, a different angle there uh, uh, where the liquid is issuing uh, uh, um, uh, at uh, some uh, uh, angle to the air stream. Uh, in this configuration, the relevant parameters are likely to be the Weber number, uh, which is essentially a momentum uh, uh, over a surface tension, and the momentum ratio, which is that uh, momentum of the um, um, liquid stream over the gas stream or vice, or vice versa. As the uh, um, uh, air uh, impacts on the jet, uh, it, uh, and if, if it has sufficiently uh, high momentum, it will lead to what's referred uh, to as surface breakup, and then the um, uh, jet itself uh, uh, will be broken, uh, and this penetration distance of the jet is an important uh, uh, distance for modelers uh, uh, to understand as to when the core uh, is actually, uh, has actually terminated. A similar uh, parameter is relevant with the co-flow configuration where the liquid and the air blast are issuing coaxially. And again, you know, there's instabilities which lead to the total breakdown of the jet and the subsequent formation or the subsequent formation of the ligaments and then the subsequent breakdown of the ligaments into droplets into the dilute spray region. 
And in this uh, uh, mode, the relevant parameters are the Weber number, be it with or without slip when you're considering the relative velocity of the gas with respect to the liquid. And the other parameter is the liquid Reynolds number. So what you'll see in the literature uh, are regime diagrams for the cross flow and the co-flow configuration. And the relevant references there are given at the bottom of the page, but essentially for the cross flow configuration, you see here the momentum ratio and you see on the horizontal axis, the Weber number and um, the demarcation lines between what's referred to as column breakup and surface and column breakup where the column of the liquid breaks, but also because of the higher uh, momentum, the surface of the jet is also broken. And in that you have modes of bag breakup and multi-mode breakup and shear uh, breakup uh, that refer to different geometries of, uh, of uh, fragments as the jet is being broken. Now with the co-flow configuration on the uh, vertical axis, the Reynolds number is plotted as the Reynolds number of the liquid. And on the horizontal axis, the Weber number on log scales, of course. And again, at sufficiently high uh, Weber number, you have the membrane breakup. Now mem mem membrane breakup is, is another terminology, if you like, for what's, what's called bag breakup, where the fluid uh, forms these bags, which subsequently lead to the formation of filaments and then, then droplets. And then if you increase the Weber number uh, even further to a few hundred, even a thousand, then that transitions into what's referred to as fiber type atomization where bags do not form anymore or, uh, and they're substituted with the form immediate formation of filaments, uh, which then break down subsequently into droplets. So for designers, the uh, important parameters are the breakup length and the fragment size. And you see empirical correlations that are given for these with respect to, uh, to the relevant parameters. And uh, I've just given you here one sample of these. If you survey the literature, you'll find there's different correlations. Um, uh, uh, there's there is, there's uh, uh, certainly um, uh, um, a number of these uh, correlating uh, to uh, different extents the uh, relevant parameters depending on the configuration, depending on the range of uh, Weber number that is covered and so on. But what it is pointing at is the fact that this field remains largely dominated by empiricism and empirical correlations, which are conveniently used by designers in order to, to optimize and enhance uh, their design. But I think the industry needs to be elsewhere now. And, uh, that's what we and others who are working in a related field are trying to do. Uh, and, uh, and what we are trying to do is embed uh, uh, or try to translate the advances in laser diagnostics and in, uh, um, in, uh, in optical imaging uh, into this field in order to put, uh, 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 to bring about quantitative uh, uh, information about the shape of those uh, uh, fragments and filaments that are formed about the statistics and the relative abundance of these, about their volume in terms of the rate at which they shed from the liquid core, about the area fractions and about the speed uh, at which they, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they atomize. So there's a number of techniques that are uh, uh, relevant and have been used for, uh, for uh, sprays, uh, for spray atomization. What we have focused on in our group is high speed two angle backlit imaging. Essentially it's backlit shadowgraphy that is uh, uh, initially used in single dimension, but we've extended that to two dimensions in order to bring about information about the um, uh, fragment uh, uh, shape. And we've used it in pulsed modes at high speed in order to enable the uh, rate uh, of uh, uh, change of these fragments to be seen, as well as the velocity uh, uh, through uh, double uh, pulsed uh, uh, PIV or particle uh, uh, tracking. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of, uh, of time on that, showing you some recent results. Now, the workhorse that we have used for this is what's referred to as the Sydney needle, a burner and the Sydney needle burner is a simple design that uses a needle uh, to inject the liquid uh, into an air blast stream, which is that blue uh, 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 um, analyst. Uh, now that needle can be translated up and down that uh, uh, analyst, uh, the air blast analyst, 
and the beauty and the simplicity of that is such that you can uh, uh, translate from a uh, from from looking at uh, dense spray uh, to uh, dilute spray. So if the liquid needle, if the knee injecting needle is at is flush with the exit plane, what you're essentially seeing is a liquid core that is atomizing. And then if you recess the liquid needle upstream, then the atomization process is hidden, uh, you know, within the um, uh, air blast stream. And what you have at the exit plane are conditions that can be, uh, you know, intermediate droplet density or even dilute, depending on how far you can recess that needle. Now we have a pilot here, which is in red. That's a pilot analyst. And the pilot analyst is simply there to stabilize flames to the burner if we want to burn this spray. And I'll show you uh, uh, towards the end of this talk, uh, I'll show you a little bit of results uh, for spray flames. So this is now a uh, backlit image uh, taken for the entire spray. So this is the injection here from the bottom uh, of the page uh, and the spray. Uh, then you can see the instabilities uh, which we can resolve uh, at the um, uh, uh, at the outer surface of the jet core, and then there is a breakup of the uh, jet, and that leads to then the subsequent formation of those odd fragments and filaments, uh, which uh, have various shapes and forms, which are breaking down as we progress through the jet to then the dilute region further uh, downstream, where then uh, uh, other processes such as vaporization and mixing and combustion, uh, if you're burning, will uh, take uh, place. So first, what is the mode of, uh, 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 of atomization? Uh, and the mode of atomization is, uh, uh, is uh, related to the wave uh, mechanism of atomization, which we have measured. So we've measured the amplitude of these waves. Now what we're measuring here, uh, we're using microscopic lenses and high-speed cameras in order to resolve fragments that are of the order uh, of about uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, microns and, and larger. So we have the ability to uh, measure Measure the wavelength and measure also the amplitude of these uh, uh, of these waves. And what we see is that the amplitude of the waves uh, for a, with a particular length uh, increases up to a particular threshold. And once that threshold, once the amplitude of the waves exceeds a given threshold, then uh, fragments will start to be shed of the liquid core, and that eventually leads to the total break of the uh, jet at some, at some downstream uh, distance. So uh, then if you monitor the ratio of the wavelength over the amplitude um, of these um, that form on the outer surface of the jet, and you do this for a whole range of configurations, different needle sizes, different Weber numbers, and, and, and so on, uh, what you see is an interesting pattern that emerges, and that is regardless of the starting point of the wavelength on amplitude ratio, uh, they all gravitate to an asymptote uh, where a jet breakup occurs at that ratio wavelength over amplitude ratio of about uh, uh, two. And what it means is that when the amplitude uh, over the wavelength is about 50%, uh, when the amplitude is about 50% of the wavelength, then that's the location of uh, jet breakup, regardless of the Weber number, regardless of the Reynolds number, and regardless of the needle geometry as well. So this is not a new result, by the way. This is a result that's been reported by Marmoton and Villamore back in the back in 2004. They reported it for a single case. What we have done is is essentially confirm the results for a much broad range of cases and much broad range of configurations. So that wave mechanism of atomization is also confirmed uh, uh, through uh, uh, our results. Uh, and what we're doing is confirming the recent results of uh, Matas et al, who have shown a regime diagram for the, uh, uh, for the various waves uh, that, uh, that, that form uh, one plotted with respect to the Weber number. And this is now a special Weber number that is plotted at the interface of the uh, liquid and gas, uh, uh, and on the other axis, the momentum uh, ratio. And what uh, they um, have identified are three types of waves, capillary waves uh, for flows dominated by surface tension, uh, convective waves due to pressure forces and confinement modes of instabilities, uh, uh, which are plotted in different color on the regime diagram here. Our results are plotted on the right-hand side of that, and the dotted um, uh, box here refers to the 
uh, uh, regimes plotted by Matas. Uh, what uh, our results confirm is that we are in the upper convective uh, region of the instability waves that dominate uh, the fragmentation, the atomization in the sprays that we have considered. Moving on now to the downstream uh, uh, region uh, of primary atomization that is in secondary atomization. Now, if I take you back to this plot here, what you see from this plot downstream of the liquid core that has fragmented now are different uh, shapes, fairly uh, uh, chaotic shapes. But if you narrow them down to a, to, uh, to, 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 to a limited number of categories, what you see essentially are droplets, you know, albeit the droplets that are, uh, are maybe, uh, maybe a little bit obloid, uh, but that is fine. They're not droplets nevertheless. You see filaments, right, with uh, filaments that are not necessarily pencil-like. They can be contorted a little bit, but you unfold them. Uh, they essentially filaments that break down into droplets. And you see also shapes like this, which are neither filaments near droplets that we refer to as irregular fragments. So what we have identified in the breakdown region are three types of shapes, droplets, and we've arbitrarily set an aspect ratio of uh, uh, three as the limit um, uh, for uh, um, uh, given jet diameters. Uh, we have uh, 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 identified second shape uh, being uh, ligaments where the aspect ratio is greater than three. Now this threshold of three is arbitrary and that needs to be revised if we're dealing with a, a higher range of Weber number. Uh, but for the range of Weber numbers that I'm going to be talking about here, it does the job quite nicely. And the third category is the irregular shapes or the unbroken uh, objects. So what we have uh, uh, done then is gone and uh, analyzed uh, 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 thousands of images that are collected in various uh, atomizing sprays uh, with different Weber numbers, different fluids, and so on, and at different axial locations from the jet. And then we have developed statistics for these shapes. And that's what this plot shows here, essentially a, um, uh, a rate of occurrence, if you like, uh, of the, those fragments for uh, uh, different axial locations within a jet. So AS2 uh, uh, has a Weber number of about uh, uh, 30, I think, or 40, and AS8, that's a acetone uh, with a higher Weber number. And this is an axial location of 0.13, and this is a downstream location of five. Now, the solid line refers to the distribution of what we term as droplets. And the number on the right hand, top right hand side within each box shows what is the proportion of droplets. About 84% of the fragments that we see in the images are droplets. And this is the mean of the droplet sizes, which is about 80 or 90 microns, the same for the AS8 case. Now the dots are the, uh, the uh, abundance, if you like, of the ligaments and about 99% of the fragments that are seen are ligaments and this is their average length, which is of the order of about, uh, um, uh, so this is 100, about uh, uh, 500, 600 microns. And then the boxes here are the other fragments, the irregular shapes, and that's about 7%. Um, now, as you go further downstream, the ligaments will fragment into droplets uh, and the irregular shapes will fragment. So then what you have further downstream is 93% of droplets, 5% of ligaments and about 2.5% of irregular shapes. Now, for a different Weber number, the trends are similar. See high proportion of droplets that even gets higher, about only 3% of ligaments that decreases further and about 1.6% of irregular shapes that decreases even further. Now, this is a small proportion in terms of number, but the total mass that is related to these fragments is significantly high. So statistics like this is useful, uh, extremely useful, in fact, particularly for those who want to model the whole process of atomization down to the Lagrangian region of accounting for, uh, for droplets because the transition from the hard core atomization or the atomization of the hard liquid core to the uh, 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 droplet uh, uh, Lagrangian region where you just do droplet tracking is uh, really uh, or has to go uh, through the uh, this uh, uh, secondary zone and the statistics that are uh, shown here will be extremely useful in demarcating that transition from the primary to the uh, uh, downstream atomization region. 
A second piece of information that we've come up with, which is interesting, is the volume fraction, uh, which is the um, uh, extent uh, of the uh, decay of the, of the liquid core on the center line. So uh, at the exit plane, uh, this is one, uh, because you have just 100% liquid, and that decays uh, to uh, zero on the center line as the atomization takes place. The relevant para controlling parameters are Weber number and momentum ratio, and I need to press on uh, a little bit. So here, uh, these plots show the uh, mean normalized volume uh, 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 and, and the plot on the right-hand side shows the effects of the momentum ratio. Essentially, you start with the liquid core and then because of the fragmentation, the volume uh, uh, increases because now you're shedding a lot of fragments and filaments as the atomization process takes place. And then as the process is completed, then the uh, normalized volume uh, decreases to a low uh, value. That same process is shown uh, with the effect of Q, except that what it's saying is that at higher momentum ratio, it happens much quicker. So now let me highlight that with respect to what happens on the center line, where we show now the normalized uh, volume. Uh, and these plots now showing the effect of increasing Weber number. And what the, uh, so the Weber number here is increasing from 40 to 80 in red to 120 in blue. And what this is showing is as the Weber number increases, the point at which the jet starts to break down uh, becomes closer to the exit plane of the liquid, uh, but it decays at a, and it decays at a rate. The rate is somewhat similar, uh, right? But the completion uh, of the atomization process occurs earlier. This now on the right hand side is the effect of Q, the momentum ratio, which increases from 0.4 for black to one for red to 8.9 for blue. And you can see here a marked effect of the momentum ratio where for 8.9, the atomization process occurs almost instantaneously uh, right at the uh, exit plane of the liquid and then decays uh, much at a much quicker rate. So this information is extremely useful and that's already being used in the development development and validation of models for atomization. Uh, I'll spend one minute on viscoelastic fluid. Uh, we have a, a, a renewed interest in, uh, well, a new interest in viscoelastic fluid. There's not a lot of work, as I said earlier, that has been done on this. Um, uh, so this is work from the 90s uh, uh, by Mansour and, and Shigie about the atomization of those viscoelastic fluid. And these are just, that's just for, for Luxi, uh, where I wanted to see the, the level of empiricism that has dominated uh, this field for a, for a long time. What we are trying to do now is generate viscoelastic fluid that represents saliva. And uh, the uh, brown uh, curve here shows the uh, viscosity versus strain rate of uh, saliva at 25 degrees. The yellow curve shows the same, but now at 37 degrees. We have a we that is in collaboration with our uh, colleagues in the rheology team. They have... Um, uh, concocted this mix of water and uh, um, and a um, um, uh, a chemical uh, which shall uh, rename uh, nameless uh, at this stage uh, to produce a viscoelastic fluid that uh, rep that is a faithful representation uh, of uh, saliva, albeit at 37 degrees. We can shift this curve down a little bit at will by changing the uh, uh, the mixture. So essentially, it's a polymer and water. So it's a very fairly benign mix. And then with that, we have just studied the uh, water glycerol uh, mix, which is a, uh, a still a Newtonian fluid, uh, but it's got a high uh, viscosity. And we've looked at, uh, uh, again, the atomization process. So this is work in progress. Uh, but the point I wanna make here is the mode of atomization of these viscoelastic fluids is different from what we're used to with respect to water and acetone and ethylene and, and ethanol in that you see, you see lots of stringy, uh, flows, lots of filaments uh, there, and those filaments uh, 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 end up taking a long time to break. But once they break, they turn, they they break into into tadpole-like structures. So essentially, a blob that is attached to a tail, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, further downstream, it tends to form those droplets. It's a more complex type of atomization that we are still in the process of studying. Now. 
Let me quickly talk about the computation of atomization uh, and how much progress has been uh, done there. Now, I'll focus on the volume of fluid approach, which is a more common, that is, of course, the, the level set approach, which is used uh, by various groups, but the VOF is probably more, more common. Essentially, the, the layout is like this, where you have a uh, you have blue represents the denser fluid, uh, and then the void, the white, the white represents the light fluid. So if you're in this quadrant here, uh, you, you, there is no interface. Uh, and alpha, that is the volume fraction is one. If you're in this quadrant here, there is um, uh, gas and the volume fraction is zero. And the phase interface is between zero and one. This is a single fluid um, uh, formulation. So the mixture or the properties of the mixture like density and viscosity uh, is um, uh, now uh, uh, a... Um, taken from the property of the liquid and property of the gas with respect to the contribution of the volume uh, uh, fraction. Now, uh, transport equations for the volume of fluid, uh, for the volume fraction that is, uh, is solved. Uh, and uh, with the VOF, uh, mass conservation is maintained, uh, but the approach remains sensitive to the resolution. And that interface between the liquid and the vapor is a very, very sharp interface that is extremely hard to, uh, to resolve, even with, uh, with refinement, uh, local uh, refinement at that interface. So values of alpha between zero and one are produced mainly by numerical diffusion as grid uh, average rather than being a genuine representation of the interface flow. So in order to improve the calculations, three other approaches are available, or at least I mentioned only three other approaches here. One is turbulent filtering, that is using turbulent filtering of the VOF, uh, which is termed as TF-VOF. And with that, a term, an additional term is added on the right-hand side of the volume fraction equation with a parameter. This is the subgrid at the subgrid scale. And this is essentially a spatially uh, filtered diffusivity um, uh, that again fails to capture the interface and uh, spatial filtering leads to unclosed uh, uh, subgrid interface forces that uh, pose a problem with respect to conversions. So when we try to refine the calculations using um, uh, this approach, then we uh, have uh, managed, uh, we have not uh, been able to get conversions. And in fact, the solution is not monotonic. The alternative approach is to add to that um, artificial compression. And with artificial compression, you add this term there to the formulation uh, there. And this term has a constant C alpha, which is really a numerical parameter that is dictated or determined by, uh, 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 determined dynamically uh, by uh, referring to the local curvature of the interface. Um, uh, and the term on the right-hand side of that, that is UR alpha times one minus alpha bar, includes the artificial, the artificial compression UR uh, which is based on uh, numerical uh, parameters and the nominal values for CR, uh, the constant that is associated uh, with this is about um, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to determine your ranges from one to four. Again, uh, uh, we have tried this uh, and uh, again failed to get conversions uh, with artificial uh, uh, compression. So with that, uh, a new concept has been developed by our group that is namely by uh, Professor Matt Cleary and postdoc Bozen uh, Wang. This is fairly recent and it's still uh, evolving, but essentially uh, uh, I'll go quickly the, um, uh, through the key steps. Uh, uh, we formulate a VOF equation using volume averaging over a physically defined volume length scale independent of the numerical uh, uh, grid scale. So essentially it's a thickening approach, um, uh, not unlike what's used in combustion with respect to, uh, to uh, thickened flames, except that here it's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it's, it's relevant to the interface only. Now we model the sub volume closures based on the parameter, based on relevant parameters. And then numerical convergence is achieved by keeping the physical length scale constant while reducing the numerical uh, grid size so that a numerical diffusion decreases and becomes overwhelmed by explicit volume uh, diffusion. This is a formulation. I won't go through the details there, but I'll just say that um, uh, models, uh, submodels have been developed for the fluctuating flux, for the stress, and for the surface uh, tension. And when we have uh, 
attempted to uh, uh, refine uh, the grid in order to see if we can get convergence using this approach. We've been successful, so the solutions uh, have converged, and uh, 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 this was an, uh, a good outcome. So now the uh, relevant submodels are being developed and um, and and published uh, or or sent for publication. Uh, so this is another illustration that shows that um, uh, grid convergence has been obtained and the values of alpha between zero and one do have uh, uh, physical uh, meaning in this case with respect to a length scale that is related to the amount of thickening to the to the to the uh, 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 the, the thickened diffusion uh, uh, layer uh, at the um, at the interface. Now, of course, uh, uh, you know this is uh, related to primary uh, atomization. Uh, one needs then to uh, uh, look at uh, the um, uh, secondary atomization region and then the downstream uh, uh, coupling uh, of that uh, uh, with a Lagrangian approach to track droplets and uh, that, that completes the formulation. Um, and that's where I think the uh, uh, statistical um, representation of those fragments that we showed earlier uh, becomes uh, uh, useful. So there's a lot of uh, uh, work that is required uh, that needs to be done in this space in order to complete the loop on, uh, on primary, on the uh, uh, modeling of primary atomization. The last section will be on, on, on uh, uh, now dense uh, spray flames and the workhorse is the same as uh, 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 earlier. There is a Sydney needle burner, but now used in conjunction with the uh, pilot. Uh, so now what we're able to do with this needle burner is recess the needle uh, from the exit plane uh, to about 80 millimeters. So when we're at the exit plane, uh, we are basically burning uh, 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 dense uh, sprays, dense liquid. And then when we're upstream, atomization takes place. So what we have at the exit plane is um, close to dilute, but not, excuse me, not quite dilute uh, uh, sprays. So these are now stability limits of the jet velocity at blow off versus the amount of liquid that is injected through the needle and they plotted for different recess distances. So this is now a recess distance of uh, zero, right, for the diamonds. And that's where the flames blow off, right, at this velocity of 50 meters a second. So underneath that, you get stable flames. If you recess the needle to 25 mil upstream of the exit plane, the stability limits improve, right? And then if you recess the needle further to 80 millimeters, the stability limits improve even further. So for the same liquid loading, let's say 60 grams a minute, the flames will look something like this. So for 80 meters a second, as we're going vertically up, the flame is stable at the recess distance of 80. And as we, we shrink the recess distance, right, uh, to bring more and more denser fluid uh, into the flow, then the flame can become unstable at the uh, at zero recess distance. So what this is saying is that the spray quality is important for flame stability. So if you're moving vertically up and you have the recess distance at zero, you reach, you reach the stability limit at this point, and you can extend that by a significant amount, almost double that by recessing it to LR equal 80. So what you're burning is dilute uh, or almost dilute, right? The line here, the dashed line that we show in this curve refers to earlier work that we've done with James Gounder uh, uh, with a genuine dilute spray. So, so the diamond, the triangles and that dashed line here, uh, they intersect at some point, they have different slope. And the reason we don't quite achieve fully dilute spray with this burner, that is with the triangles is because uh, we can't recess the needle sufficiently longer distance in order to produce a genuine dilute uh, uh, spread, uh, right? But still, nevertheless, at LR equal 80, we're sufficiently close to dilute spread. Now, we've recently investigated much higher Weber numbers. Now, the Weber numbers that we've used here are of the order of about 100. We've recently used to much higher Weber numbers because they're relevant to uh, gas turbine uh, manufacturers. So we bumped up the Weber number to 1,000 and we plotted the stability limit with respect to uh, Weber number versus equivalence ratio. Mm, uh, I want to dwell a lot on that. I just want to say that this is a region of interest. Now, what about diagnostics to understand the reaction zone structure? So what we have done recently is applied um, joint imaging of me scattering and laser-induced fluorescence of OH and formaldehyde. So it's a 
three camera experiment in order to resolve the reaction zones. And, um, um, and, and you can't do that straight away uh, because what you, uh, what you stumble across is problems of interference, is Raman scattering that now interferes with the laser induced fluorescence. And now the droplet that you shine the laser uh, through now uh, actually uh, become, uh, become like little micro lasers. Uh, so what you have is, is Raman scattering from the, uh, from the first Stokes shift, but you also have the second and the third and the fourth Stokes shift that are uh, uh, now stimulated and they emit uh, a, a signal which then interferes with the lift. So what we have had to do is monitor where these stoke shifted Raman interferences are. And then we had to um, uh, order a special filter that blocks these interferences where they appear. And then once that filter is um, added to the line, then we're able to perform these measurements. So now uh, these are images now uh, at 10 Hertz uh, for formaldehyde, for OH. The uh, joint imaging of formaldehyde and OH, when you couple those images together, you get a heat release um, uh, indicator, a fairly good indicator of the heat release. And when you couple that with me scattering, that tells you where the droplets are. So what we have at the bottom end of this image here is a nice uh, view of where the heat release zones are in the flame at different axial locations. So this X on D10, 15, uh, 20, and 24. And these are representative images of what we see in those flames. So what I want to draw your attention to is the existence of these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, circles, right, those rings, uh, if you like, uh, right, which seem to be a common occurrence in these flames. So dwelling a little bit on the formation of these rings, what you see is a, a pattern that is evolving. You see small rings, you see large rings. Now those rings are initiated by contact with the reaction zone. Remember, these are heat release zones now. So these uh, uh, are initiated by contact. They burn, uh, they separate they grow and they burn as they grow. Now in burning, you can see that some of these rings are housing more than one droplet. And you can see uh, there is here a large number of droplets here. You can also see instance where there is point combustion. So you see a ring forming around a single, uh, single droplet. And statistically, you can look at how many uh, of these rings uh, form. Uh, over a period of time, and we have counted these, uh, that is uh, uh, Gajendra has counted these as part of his PhD thesis and has developed here the rate of the formation of these rings uh, over an assembly of images. And you see a pattern forming as to how many of these rings form with axial distance and how they change with Weber number. And you can see here that these rings increase in terms of their rate of formation uh, with, their, um, uh, with increasing uh, Weber number. What do these rings mean? Do they refer to single droplet uh, combustion, to group combustion, or to all the above? We have made use here of a regime diagram that has been recently published by the group of Mastarakas, that is Oliveira and Mastarakas from Cambridge, uh, uh, where they uh, uh, show various um, uh, propagation regimes, droplet propagation, inter-droplet and gaseous, like with respect to the group number um, uh, that's defined in the paper and elsewhere in the early um, uh, uh, work on this, uh, on this topic, uh, plotted versus equivalence ratio. Our results uh, occupy the, are plotted on the left-hand side through these orange squares there, and then what they, and they're spanning the uh, right-hand side of the regime, which is saying that what we have is interdroplet propagation as well as gaseous light propagation. I'd like to conclude, and I know I'm running sort of uh, over time, so I'll just take one minute to conclude by making a hypothetical projection here with respect to the uh, mixed mode and inhomogeneous combustion that one would expect to be dominant in these um, spray flames. Now, and I make use here of a scatter plot that we have generated from uh, measurements taken at Sandia National Labs in the Sydney inhomogeneous gaseous burner, where we uh, uh, generate uh, um, uh, inhomogeneous mixtures and we let these inhomogeneous mixtures burn and we see the transition of the burning of these inhomogeneous mixtures from, uh, from uh, uh, pre-mixed mode of burning uh, or stratified mode of burning to diffusion 
type combustion. What I'm hypothesizing uh, is that combustion in these spray flames is, uh, is very much like the uh, uh, inhomogeneous mode of combustion uh, that we've seen in those gaseous uh, uh, flames. Uh, and then what I am claiming here is that within those rings, what we have is burning of um, uh, 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 premixed and stratified possibly mixtures. Uh, and then we have at the same time burning of diffusion uh, uh, like uh, layers uh, that uh, uh, are similar to the scatter plots that we're seeing on the right hand side. Unfortunately, we cannot demonstrate that because we do not have the capabilities to measure mixture fraction in these dense flames. We have attempted to do that as the last experiment that was done at Sandia National Labs in Barlow's laboratory. And that was presented at the last symposium. We were not able to go to the dense part of the, uh, uh, of the spray where droplets exist because the interference becomes uh, uh, too uh, intense. Um, and that really uh, probably is a good point to close uh, the talk because that sort of leaves us with a challenge uh, of, uh, uh, um, uh, or a multi-level challenge uh, uh, to say that, uh, yes, we've made, or the community has made significant progress in understanding atomization and combustion sprays. There's still a lot uh, to be done. And I mentioned here the need to measure uh, the evolution of 3D structures in atomization improve the modeling of atomization, joint measurements of temperature, mixture fraction, droplets and reactive species. This is a big, big wish list here, temperature. We've already uh, uh, collaborated with Bob Lucht at Purdue to use uh, cars for measuring temperature in those uh, flames that I've just shown here, but these are just separated measurements of temperature. The elusive uh, uh, parameter is mixture fraction there, which is very difficult. And then uh, uh, various groups have looked at tracers and so on, but it hasn't been successful to date. So that's really, I'm posing that as a challenge for future generations. And last but not least is to resolve soot formation processes in turbulent spray flames as, as well. So challenges are significant and I'll leave that uh, for, um, uh, for as food for thought for uh, people who want to venture into uh, this field into the future. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. That's all the time we have and that's all the uh, questions we have as well. So uh, thanks again for the great talk. If people would like to turn on their cameras to thank the speaker and uh, we'll close out the webinar here then.